Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thank you for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring thought leaders in the career and personal growth arena. You spend a significant portion of your life at work, so my goal is to provide you with tools, inspiration, and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I am delighted to welcome my very special guest to the show today, Todd Rose. Todd, welcome. Thanks for having me. Hey, Todd, I'm really excited to unpack your amazing book, The End of Average, How We Succeed in the World That Values Sameness. But I do want to tell our our listening audience all about you. Todd Rose is the director of the Mind, Brain, and Education program at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where he leads the Laboratory for the Science of the Individual. He is also the co-founder of the Center for Individual Opportunity, a nonprofit organization that promotes the principles of individuality in work, school, and society. And he lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So welcome to the show, Todd. I'm really excited excited to learn more about the book, The End of Average. So you claim that average is really just a myth. So explain that to me. How, how did that all come to pass? And, and really, what prompted you to write this book? Well, so, you know, it, it's true. So this basic claim that seems almost like a bumper sticker slogan, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, there's no average person. It turns out to be this scientific fact, right? That, um, you know, we think of ourselves like there's some bell curve with a middle and that's the person, but in fact, it doesn't exist. And it's something we've really only uncovered over the last decade in science, but it has enormous implications for the way we structure jobs and the way we educate. So, so I wrote the book mainly for this reason, which is as a scientist, I'm watching the failure of averages, you know, come across like medicine and, you know, cancer research and everything. But the place where I realized it wasn't having an impact is in human potential. So the way we educate and the way we hire, the way we assess performance, um, and the way we think about ourselves as human beings. And I felt like um, there's all these challenges we have in the world right now. And uh, that getting beyond average, I think, is the most critical thing we can do to find the solutions we need to the problems we have. So unpack the science of the individual for me, because I think that will give such clarity to the listener. Sure. So let me give it, I'll give an example okay. of what I mean. So, um, you know, I do neuroscience research, among other things. And like most fields of science, the way we do research, we would bring, if you were part of my study, you'd come in, put you in a scanner, give you a task, and get your brain activity. But then what we do is we automatically combine your brain pattern with everybody else in the group, and we produce an average brain pattern. And then we publish that, right? And yeah. that's, that's, and of course, the underlying assumption was that that average brain pattern has to relate to some people, right? But what's really crazy is that now we found out that more often than not, literally the average brain pattern represents nobody, and that individual brains do tasks in very unique ways, um, that are but they're understandable. So what happened was in this average-based science, we found in field after field when we've actually looked at individuals. We found the same thing. For example, there's no average cell. There's mm-hmm. no average genome. There's no average cancer. There's no average nutrition. And so what's happened is in this science that I'm a part of is once we realize that, we, it's kind of embarrassing, frankly. Um, but we've realized, okay, well, there's a better way to do it, which is focus on patterns of individuality first yeah. Yeah. and then combine. So anyway, this is sweeping all these fields of science. And I think it's, it really matters for human potential, too. You know, if you're willing, I'd love for you to consider sharing your individual story because it's very poignant. You're a tremendously successful person, obviously well-educated, very smart. However, you had a tough time early on in your academic career. Would you be willing to share that with our audience? You bet. You bet. Yeah, no, it's, um, I've experienced the, the extremes, I think, of yeah. success and failure. So um, I actually dropped out of high school uh, with a 0.9 GPA, which I think you actually have to work pretty hard to do that poorly. But, <laughs> exactly. you know, that's, <laughs> um, but, but, you know, and I, um, just to, you know, I'll just expand on the story. Like when they kicked me out of school, um, my girlfriend, uh, the same month told me she was pregnant and she's still my wife today. I have to say, um, lovely, lovely. and so that was an interesting start to my professional life, you know, bouncing around a bunch of minimum wage jobs that were just awful. Um, and not really knowing why 
my life wasn't working out the way I, I wanted it to. Um, and so, you know, I felt the experience of like the downside of having a system really not fit my individuality and the consequences of that. And so, you know, out of really almost sheer despair, like I didn't know where I wanted to go, but I knew where I was at was not where I wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I believe deeply in the transformative power of education. Um, I watched my dad, who was the first high school graduate in our family, go on to college and be a, become an engineer. And, you know, so I decided I was going to go to college at night um, in the only school that would accept me. <laughs> and um, I, I slowly transformed the, the view of myself as a learner. But, but, and I ended up graduating the top of my class and I got accepted to Harvard for my doctorate. Um, but what I noticed was, like, when I would take courses on human behavior or learning or development, the way they talked about people and, 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 you know, potential, it didn't really seem to map at all with how I was being successful. And so that really got me curious about like, why was that the case? And I kind of thought I was just quirky, right? Like maybe a little yeah. weird. And, but, but once I got to Harvard and I got to dig into the science, I realized, no, there's just like a fundamental flaw in the right. way that we've think, thought about people. Well, as, as a father and now as a, as a professor and someone who's working in higher education in the academy, do you think that we're, we're failing our students, giving them this um, pedagogical approach that is just singular? There's got to be diversity of path, right, in how we, how we learn and how we teach. Yep. I, I, without a doubt, we're failing kids. And, um, you know, what I think is important, what I tried to outline in the book was this was actually intentional. Mm. Um you know, the architects of our system, our educational system, but also our management systems yeah. and how we structured the industrial sort of factory model really gave up on the idea that people were worth investing in. And there was this sense that basically most people were just mediocre. And the goal of education became giving everyone a batch process experience and trying to find the eminent, right? Yeah. Sort the best from the rest right. using really narrow, narrow metrics because it was assumed Really, if you were talented at one thing, you were talented at most things. Mm -hmm. So we built that in, right? So um, all on this assumption that average was a good way to think about people. And and the problem is, is that it, it, it doesn't work scientifically, but, you know, even just morally, like I think about my own kids and I think, man, the, like the worst thing that we do to them is we basically have them trade in a sense for who they are as individuals, their passions, their goals, their strengths and weaknesses in this sort of game of averages where they have to be just like everyone else, only yeah. better. Yeah. It's almost the eternal generalist. Everybody has to be equally good, right? Or, or yeah. even equally bad. And I liken this, Todd, to the career world when I think of that proverbial performance evaluation. You know, the first thing the manager does is go right to the heart of, okay, this is what you're not doing well in. Here are your weaknesses. How can we get you back up to speed? So I, I think we are, we are failing our colleagues in the career world as well based on that same model. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, in this new science I'm a part of, um, one of the core ideas is this thing we call jaggedness, which is all talent and potential has multiple dimensions to it, and you can't ever reduce it to a single score. Right. And yet when you think about performance reviews, right, like, that's exactly, that's exactly what, we what do. they do. Yeah. yeah, and we even force people into like this kind of curve sometimes. And, you know, some, like only a few people can be fives or whatever we call it, you know. Mm -hmm. And what I think is really fascinating um, in the workplace is, you know, companies like Deloitte that have figured out these one-dimensional metrics just flat out they do don't not, work. they don't yeah. work. Yeah. And they, they're getting to these new really contextualized solutions that I think are really groundbreaking and better ways to understand um, employees. I do too. And and just to give a shout out to Deloitte, I think they are extraordinary in so many ways. And it's not just linear growth. I'm sure you're familiar with their, their uh, well-researched lattice model that people are really zigzagging in all uh, different directions. And it doesn't mean that they're moving backwards in their career, but they're flexing different muscles and learning new things. And it's really revolutionized retention for them. So it's extraordinary to see that. Yeah. Todd, let's talk and again, your research is, is so compelling. You argue that perhaps schools, colleges, universities should grant credentials instead of diplomas. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> we built this education model, this standardized model, where essentially it doesn't matter what you care about, what you want to be. Right now, it's fixed amount of time, 
grade based and you get a diploma. Yeah. Right. Like a four year diploma. It doesn't matter if you care about French literature or, you know, robotics. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can totally understand why it's good for the system. Right. Much, much easier to manage if you're a university. But if the goal is to cultivate talent, right, to allow an individual to come in, figure out what they're good at and get credit for that and then uh, and develop a career off of it, it's really a pretty bad model. And yeah. what I think is really fascinating is there are actually solutions out there. So this credentialing approach is, is sweeping across the country where it's like, why wouldn't you just reduce it the, to the smallest unit you can, right? Like, and get credit for that thing you're learning. And then you can stack all those together in very unique kinds of ways. And if it takes four years, it takes four years. But if it takes two, it takes two. Um, and added to that as this push for competency based learning. So mm-hmm. right now, you know, I have two kids that are both in college, you know, I send them there and I pay their tuition because I want them to master, you know, concepts and skills that will allow them to have the job they want. But really what they get is a grade that compares them to the people sitting next to them. Exactly right. Yeah. Like what is that? That doesn't make any sense. Right. right. So right. shifting to like, instead of a diploma, you get, you get credentials and, those credentials are based on competency. You know, have you mastered the material or have you not? And I think that, you know, 10 years ago, that seemed revolutionary and like something that would be really hard to do. But it's really incredible today um, how many how many universities are going in that direction. Well, and employers. Well, that's encouraging to hear that the employers, pardon me, that the uh, that the universities are going toward the credentialing. That's exciting to hear. And I hope that translates to seasoned professionals as well. I think that lifelong learning model of let's keep credentialing and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go back for graduate work, right? It could be credentials based, but let's go to the employer. And you gave a great example of the book about Google. Google is still one of the most sought after companies for new college grads. Uh, You probably know, I think the average age of a Google employee is 27. So it's still a very young company and uh, very hot for young millennial talent. So Typically, they come to campus of the top schools and they, they recruit the top GPAs, but they have retention issues and there are some problems. How will they turn that around? Yeah, so, you know, it's such a good example of the breakdown of this sort of average-based approach to thinking about um, hiring. So for a very long time, Google thought that the best way to get the top talent and keep it was to basically look at a really narrow set of metrics, um, your GPA, um, your SAT score and um, the prestige of the school you went to. Right. And that almost seems like obvious, right? Like, like okay, in this average based system we've created, that seems like that would work. But to their credit, they realized it really wasn't. They weren't getting the people that they thought they were getting exactly. and they weren't keeping the people they wanted to keep. So um, Todd Carlyle at Google initiated this massive study, just like, like you know, they're a data company. So let's yeah, figure out yeah. what works. A billion data points um, looked at like, every predictor they could possibly think of, they asked all their executives, like, what do you think predicts? You know, and they have all these quirky ideas. So here's what they found out. It turns out the metrics that they were relying on, like your GPA only predicts if you've been, if you, after you've been out of school for two years, it doesn't predict anymore. Nothing, um, I agree. At exactly. all. And SAT scores don't Forget predict it. at all. Forget at all. It. And, and even the prestige of, of where you went to school, which, you know, as someone that's at Harvard, that's not good for us. But, you know, that's you know, it's, it turns while, out not to really matter. You're not judged and, on your resume. Exactly. Yeah. And so what they've done is they've come up with much more sophisticated, contextualized view of talent and looking at performance. And it's expanded, like, the pool that they kind of what they call fishing in, you know, like. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and they've gotten, you know, they've even had a program where they've looked at, like, people that have. They don't go to college at all and trying to find ways of just finding talent wherever it is. And I think it's such a a refreshing take on on talent identification. It is. It is. And I appreciate that. I couldn't agree more. So let's talk a little bit about what you refer to in the book as the apprenticeship model. And and I often think of that as the old world model Um, in, in trades. Certainly that was very common. But we have not done that in the United States for, for centuries. So tell me about the apprenticeship model and why it might be better than what we know is the modern day internship. Yeah, no, I think that the apprenticeship model is making a comeback. It's funny, like, we tend to think we're inventing something new. Right, right? Like, we're just guys, bringing it back. This is, yeah. yeah, this is, <laughs> is that um, so much of the work that we do now isn't standardized. Yeah. Uh, 
and it requires a pretty like high skill set um, that frankly only you can only get so much from you know sitting in the classroom and um, so what we're seeing is a lot of really innovative companies are actually developing this kind of hybrid apprenticeship model where um, you know they're basically bringing people in and saying, look, do you have the basics? Like, do you have the desire? Do you, you know, but like not trying to just cherry pick people that have top grades and stuff and saying, look, if you want this, we're going to actually align you with our experts and we're going to help you develop the master you need. And we're going to give you a job. And I'll tell you, there's one company that I, it isn't that well known, but deserves to be like really well known. And it's an Indian IT company um, called Zoho. And they did this. And if you, if you don't mind, I can tell you a little bit about Please do, yes. So so they're in this fierce competition for, you know. Talent. In, yeah. Like, and what their founder realized is that, um, you know, in India in particular, it's super hierarchical. And, yes. like, if you don't go to the top IT school, like, forget it. But um, he, after about 10 years, he realized when he looked at his own data that there really wasn't a correlation between where people went to school and how well they did in this company. And he thought, well if that were true, what would I do next? Yeah. And so he decided to create what's called Zoho university. And it's not really a university, but it's this apprenticeship kind of model where he went to essentially the untouchables, you know, in rural India to these kids that some of them had never even seen a computer before. Um, and said, look, if you want this, I'm going to bring you in for 18 months. We're going to pay you. And there's no contract. Like wow. you don't even have to work for us when you're done. Um, and we're going to teach you some basic programming. So like that, so he thought, he thought that he was going to be doing um, some charity, basically. And maybe yeah. they'd find a hidden gem here or there. But after having this program for 10 years, they have something like 25% of all of their engineers have come through this program. That's incredible. And now they've made a commitment internally to make it 50%. Wow. And I, I look at that and I think, okay, the value of this is the apprenticeship model is, look, you're going to meet this person where they're at, right? And your job is to develop them, you know, like yeah. you just got to get the most out of them. And when you have that mindset, like suddenly a, an Indian IT company can actually just, I mean, they are a absolutely competing with salesforce.com yeah. and Microsoft yeah. and they have great product. And I think, you know, we look around now and say, oh, we have this skills gap. We have these good jobs and people can't fill them. And, and, and we, I don't buy it. Yeah, I, we're I looking think, for the talent in the wrong place. Exactly. Wow, that's a great story. I'm so glad that, that you shared that. So, Todd, here's something that is a bit controversial, but I'm okay with that. Let's go there. And in the end of average, you talk, you warn against uh, overgeneralizing about people. So, for example, you talk a little bit about introverts and extroverts and how it's really a fallacy to categorize someone as such. And, and you know, with Susan Cain's book, Quiet, and all of this um, fascinating um talk about introversion and extroversion. It's a hot topic right now. So what's your take? Yeah. So first of all, I love, I love her book. I do um, too. Yeah, <laughs> so, I do too. Um, and I think that she was re rebalancing, like we've gone way too far in, in sort of valuing extroversion for its own sake. But yeah. um, so here's, here's what the science tells us. And I think it, I think it's really powerful and kind of intuitive. You think about it. So right now we tend to think you have a trait. So like I'm an extrovert. And that, that just somehow sits above every situation that I'm in. But in reality, your brain is phenomenally contextualized. And so what we see is when we measure people in different contexts, it turns out that, yeah, I might be an extrovert when I'm around friends. And I might actually be kind of introverted when I'm with colleagues that I don't know very well. Um, and so what we see is instead of defining traits, we define what we call if-then signatures. So yeah. if I'm with friends, I'm extroverted. And those if-then signatures are really, really predictive of your behavior. Whereas when we use traits, it's crazy how poorly they predict your, your behavior. There you go. I like it. So again, let's not generalize, right? Let's think situationally and let's think there are many layers to every person. Yeah. And, and you think about when we, when we hire someone, we say that the, the standard like job description is just full of traits or these yeah. weird average based things like you need to be a good communicator. Well, there's not someone that's just a good communicator right, right. in general. There's no one definition. Yeah. So, absolutely. So I, I was thrilled to see you talk or write about in the book about Costco, another company that's really in the, the news these days very positively because they're doing extraordinary things that are trumping their competitors and they have incredible employee retention and employee engagement. So tell us the success story of Costco. Yeah. So, um, 
you know, as a life, like for a very long time, I've been a member. So I've always been proud of, of that yeah. company, but, yeah. but I got to spend some time with the founder, um, Jim Senegal. And, you know, so basically here's, here's a company that actually has the highest wages in retail. Right. And, you know, they, they compete with like Sam's club and stuff. Right. And for a long time, people thought, well, it's just kind of like the Cadillac model and, you know, sure, you're going to pay them a lot, but then you just have to charge more or whatever, right? Um, whereas something like Walmart, you know, which th th they succeed very nicely in the game of averages. Um, what happened with, with Costco, though, is when you dig into their employees, they're, they're far more productive, they're really passionate, and they don't leave. So, um, you know, Walmart has turnover that approaches like 40%. Right. I mean, that is unbelievable. It's, yeah, it's unsustainable. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It is. And so basically you, you can no longer have a model where you trust the talent. Right. Yeah. You just know they're going to leave. So you're just kind of everyone's like just kind of treading water mm -hmm. um, and you kind of have to employee proof your system. Yeah. Where, whereas at Costco, what they've done is from the very beginning, they made a bet. Um, and Jim spoke eloquently about this to me, about how he viewed individuals as employees as something to invest in like mm -hmm. truly and he said it's like this unwavering commitment you have to make and you can't back off of it so they do things like um you know they they don't rely on traditional metrics for hiring um they promote from within almost entirely yeah. so there's all these career paths and they have their managers spend 90 percent of their time teaching instead of like trying to govern people and right. what you see is they're after one year they're they're their uh, attrition rate is somewhere between four and six percent. Wow, that's and so yeah, it's crazy. So yeah. what happens is, like the savings they get from having people be productive and stick around, ends up meaning that they actually spend less per employee than than Sam's Club does. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful model. Employee engagement, it's hard to get, but they're nailing it. They're making yep. it happen. And I love that concept of managers as teachers. You know, they're coaches. They're, they're there to grow and develop that talent. Todd, your book is so extraordinary. The End of Average, How We Succeed in a World that Values Sameness. So let's get to it. How do we buy the book and how do we follow you in the world of social media? Sure. So the book is out now and it's available in every major um, bookseller, including Amazon and Barnes and Noble and, and your independent bookstores. Um, and if people want to follow me, um, the easiest is on Twitter. It's a uh, handles L Todd Rose. Excellent. Todd, what a joy to have you on today. I learned so much. I love the book. It's going to be on my, my favorite book list that I'm sharing with clients and colleagues and friends. So I thank you for that. And I hope our professional paths cross in person next time. Me too. Thanks hey, for having me. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to Your Working Life, where my goal is to help you design your career destiny so it doesn't happen by default. Career and life satisfaction is possible, and it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. Now, my show is available on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, and Stitcher. Leave a comment, because I always appreciate hearing from my listeners. I'm Caroline Dowd-Higgins. Take good care.